Um, my name is Mary Vandewart. I'm the uh, program manager for the Oral Health Zone in Minnesota, and I get to introduce uh, your speakers this morning. Um, these are these are folks from Caring Hands Dental in Alexandria. They're one of uh, the Nash the Tooth Fairies affiliates. I'm I'm happy to say. Um, we've got L. There they are in Alexandria. L. L. Olson is the executive director of Caring Hands Dental Clinic, and he's joined by dentists Dr. Richard Moan, president of the board, and James Waltz, vice president of the board, and Mary Lou Olson, his wife and a registered dental hygienist. These uh, presenters will share how the Caring Hands Dental Clinic began as a way to keep dental emergencies out of the hospital emergency rooms and how it became a regional dental oasis for thousands of citizens served by Minnesota health care programs. Veterans and the uninsured citizens of all ages, and I didn't read that very well. Should I do that again? <laughs> Um, they became a regional dental oasis for thousands of citizens served by mental he Minnesota health care programs, veterans, and the uninsured citizens of all ages, and better oral health care in rural Minnesota for the underserved. Um, I also forgot to mention, sorry, that the, the, there, are dent, uh, there are continuing dental education credits available for this session. You just need to sign up on the sheet in the back at that high top where, um, where Katie is. So um, with that, we'll let uh, Dr. Moen get started. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting us to this coalition. Um, the Caring Hands Dental Clinic in Alexandria is a uh, nonprofit, 501c3. Um, myself, uh, I was a practicing dentist for 30 years in Morris, Minnesota. And due to some health issues, I retired about six years ago and got it affiliated with the Caring Hands Clinic, which at that time was a totally volunteer system of providing care for the underserved out there. Um, through the years, um, with some wonderful help and participation from the volunteers, uh, we have evolved into a full clinic. We have two full-time dentists practicing, full-staffed, full, staffed, full um, uh, with all the appropriate equipment, and uh, now we've expanded into outreach clinics around the state, uh, particularly Western Minnesota. Um, my affiliation kind of goes back to my practice career. I um, all private dentists deal with this reimbursement issue and and the costs of of care for the public program patients, and it's a real um, mental gymnastics that we, we have to do to justify the loss of money versus helping the underserved. Um, I know the presentation that we heard earlier, they, they, they talk about, you know, the state and what they've tried to do over the years to try to increase access and stuff like that. And it kind of always looks like it's the dentists or the bad people here. Um, from the other side of the coin, we aren't, but it gets to a point where you can't do it anymore. And that's kind of where we're at with things. So with the clinic um, and getting involved with that and the model that Al and Mary Lou put together over time, I thought, wow, this is really a cool thing. Um, my heart's always been for the children. It's, not the children's fault that they're in the situations they're in. And so I've always taken care of the children that were in my practice in Western Minnesota. When I moved to Alec and found out about what they were doing and I was asked to be on the board, that was one of my first things that we can help the kids. And that's, again, you know, really dear to my, to my heart. Watching what they've been doing with these children and now the adults, and with our full-time clinic, we really have created a dental home for our patient base. And that's, I think, is paramount. We can do clinics that see emergencies, you know, mostly tooth extractions and stuff like that, get people out of pain. But what we are trying to do is create a dental home. And I think they've been very successful. My hats are off to to Alan and Mary Lou and his staff 
Uh, they've done a tremendous job. Um, so I'm just, we have some going forward, some concerns as a board. Um, a lot of them are legislative and I'm not gonna bore you with that. I'll let Al bore you with that. <laughs> um, but a lot of it has to do with um, the reimbursement. Um, I have a, personally and for the board, have a huge concern about going forward with a single payer system. I worry about who is that single payer. Because if you look at our difference in reimbursement to come to our clinic from the different payers, it's huge. And right now, our biggest supporter is, is Prime West, and they do, they're a 13 county, uh, county based purchasing, and they see what we're doing, they understand what we're doing, and they want to make sure that we're successful. And so their reimbursement is at a, where we survive. We lose Prime West in a single payer system, and it goes to one of the other providers, we'll probably have to close the door because we cannot afford to stay open. So just want to get that out as a, my number one concern as a board member, looking forward to legislative issues, if we go to a single payer, who's that single payer? And I want everybody to think about that too. Um, and we got other things, we're always doing battle down there, we're kind of getting known down to the legislature, kind of pains once in a while, but you know, you got to keep at it, so. Um, so with that, I was kind of just a simple uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Jim Waltz, a retired dentist from Plainview that moved back to his hometown of Alexandria, Minnesota. I cornered him at a Christmas party a couple years ago about he needs to be on the board. Guess what? He, we got him. So thank you very much for inviting us here today. Well, I'm the new kid on the block of this Curing Hands Dental Clinic. I've only been on a board since early 2014, so it's only been just a little over a year now. And uh, I, I practiced for 38 years down in Plainview, which is a little town northeast of Rochester, about 17 miles, a town of about 4,500 people. So it was a small town practice. And I went through the same frustrations with... Uh, with the underserved there that most private dentists have, you know, is, is trying to justify how many of them you can take when you're, when you're losing every time that you deal with a person. It, it's tough, but, you know, and it, and it was frustrating. So then when I moved, I retired, moved up to Alexandria, and uh, I had no idea that I was going to be involved in dentistry again when I got there. I thought I was retired. But, uh, but so I was invited by Rich to become on the board, and I joined, and I... The first thing I was impressed is when I went to the dental clinic and met Al, the administrator here, he overwhelmed me with the knowledge that he has on, on, on dealing in this subject and some of the humongous frustrations both him and his wife have been through getting to where they are now because the grassroots were, I mean, it was just unbelievable where they've come. The uh, office they're in now is a, is a dental clinic that is, I would be, impressed just to work there myself. The setting is beautiful. It's, it's uplifting for the staff, and it's uplifting for the people they serve. And their primary purpose is, well, number one, to you know, take care of the dental problems. But they also educate the people, and they, and, they, and they try to actually improve their lives by teaching them responsibilities. That, you know, if, if you don't make an appointment, that you have to call in, and, and it's paramount that you know, that they do that. So I'm going to just, I'm not going to bore you with any more that I have to say because Al's going to go over all of this and, and, and in detail. And, uh, but first I want to let his, his dear wife, Mary Lou, give a little talk. And she's going to talk about, she was actually the grassroots of the clinic before Al ever entered the picture. So I'll let her talk about that a little bit. Okay. In the beginning, it was kind of crazy. Um, some of my hygiene colleagues encouraged me to go out and get a collaborative agreement so we could do a basic screening survey for Head Start kids. That's kind of where my passion was, was seeing children who didn't have care. 
uh, stopping the disease at the early age. Of course, we know that's going to be an ongoing situation through our whole lives. It's, it's, we're never going to be out of work. When we first started carrying Hands Dental Clinic, we begged, borrowed, and almost stole everything we had to practice with. We had a building, a facility with two dental treatment rooms and nothing in them. We looked online, found dental equipment that was not being used anymore, that was shoved in a back corner. Um, went to all the dental offices in town asking, if you have anything that you're not using, we'd be happy to take it off your hands. We got old restorative equipment, restorative materials they weren't using anymore. They've upgraded to better things. And so we got the things that were left over. Uh, dental stools that were down in their basement that they had gotten new, much better things. Um, an ultrasonic cleaner that we had to plug in and every time we used it because it didn't have a timer on it anymore. But we were thankful for everything we got. One of our volunteers that we had told me that some of the dentists, we had at this point 15 dentists volunteering on Fridays. Um, all of our staff that we had at that time were all volunteers. They worked on their day off to help underserved people who were not getting dental care. But one of the volunteers from Tastefully Simple who was helping me do the business plan told me some of the dentists she talked to didn't want to work in our facility because they really hurt when they left because our equipment was so old, it was very uncomfortable to work in our clinic. Well, through some other grants, we were able to get some dental chairs that were a little bit more comfortable. But we still had a facility that needed to grow. I was taking the dental charts home in the evenings and billing on weekends. My children would come to visit, and I said, oh, you've got to help me do my billing. I, I have all this billing to do. I don't have time to do it during the week because I was still working another full-time position. They, it wasn't long, and I told the board, I said, I, I need help. I can't do this. I'm answering phone calls, returning phone calls at my lunch hour. I'm making supper in the evenings on the phone, returning phone calls. Weekends, I'm just doing this. I need someone to help me with. At that time, it was one dentist, a volunteer assistant, two volunteers assistants, and myself working in the clinic. Well, I was recruiting Al to help me with the billing on, on weekends, and it wasn't long when he thought, well, you know, I could help you till you can find somebody else. And he was returning phone calls, and I gave him a dental assistant book from the, a school that I had. I was an assistant before I was a hygienist. And he studied the book, and he learned the, what a dental assistant is required to do. Um, I made him go get hep B shots so he could help with sterilization because we just were running out of time. All of us, we were seeing patients. Well, when we approached the board and talked to them about having some help, Al said, you know, I think I can do this for a while. So he jumped in not with both feet, but all of his arms, everything. He learned everything about an office you can learn. He's assisting the docs that are doing extractions with fillings, helping with restorative. He's getting the volunteer dentists to come in. That kind of let me sit back a little bit and just see patients. Well, it wasn't long after he jumped in when everything just took off. We went from two treatment rooms to four treatment rooms to now a whole brand new state-of-the-art facility. Uh, he learned all the, the billing techniques. Um, if someone that we billed to didn't pay, I didn't have time to search why or how come. Or I just kind of, oh, well, we're out that money. Not Al. He made sure that every penny that we were reimbursed, supposed to be reimbursed for, came back to the clinic. Because that's the only money we had was what was reimbursed by treatment we provided and donations. And at that time, to get a grant from a big company, we didn't have a background or you know, they didn't want to give us any money because are you going to be here tomorrow? It, now that's changed also thanks to Al and all of his hard work. One of our hygienists that started on as a volunteer, when I offered her the full-time position, when we offered her the full-time position, she also was a little concerned. You know, I'm quitting my two jobs that I'm going to for a job that, are you going to be here next year? I think we're going to be there for a long time, thanks to Al and all his hard work. I'm going to turn it over to him and let him take it from here. Um, without him, we would not be where we are. He's just really stepped in and, and made it. Like I say, we've got two hygienists, three hygienists, three dental assistants, two doctors, two front staff, all on a regular full-time staff now. It's wonderful. But um, go ahead, Al. I'm going to have you go ahead and tell the rest about the clinic. Thank you. I paid these guys to say that, by the way. <laughs> you can do anything with money. The uh, 
clinic is something special to all of us now. Um, when I first started, it was a temporary position that my wife said, oh, honey, dear, just a few months, just to help us out, get things rolling, because I did have a regular job. I just didn't work so much. And uh, it's turned out to be probably the most enjoyable almost 10 years that I've had. Um, guys are pretty tough, you know, so we don't think too much about this soft stuff, but I'll tell you, our clinic, uh, you see a lot of tears from the patients in our cells. I never had that in 30 years of retail, you know. Um, the closer we ever got to tears in retail is when some customer was chewing me out for something. So, <laughs> so, the, so being in a clinic like this is just a uh, completely different business than what I was used to. I was used to business where you had to go make money. And my wife threw me into a hornet's nest where you're not going to make money. How are you going to make that work? So we did. We drew this plan up, and uh, the original board of directors um, bought it, per se. And then when they asked me to run it, um, I kind of went, well, whoa, <laughs> I'm not looking for a job. But the clinic um, survives off the reimbursements, um, but we need community support to make it work, and that was part of the business plan. And we've obtained more community support than we ever thought we would. We've also obtained more patients than we ever thought we would. Uh, the clinic uh, initially uh, was expected to maybe handle our county, which had approximately 3,000 patients that were served by the Minnesota health care programs. Those uh, counties have expanded through uh, emergencies last year. We did 619 dental emergencies we took treatment for, and that was from 50 different counties. Uh, so they're traveling a long, long ways because, uh, number one, you lose money on emergencies. There is no, there is no profit. I mean, even at a retail level, I think the doctors would conclude there's just not much money in emergencies. So these people travel a long ways to do that. So we've seen that expansion um, going further and further all the time. What we really needed to do now was to expand the clinic more than what we were just at our original location, which we've done at our home clinic. Uh, we are uh, large, and we're looking at another expansion, adding eight more operatories, should the grants and donations come through as they have before. But we did start the uh, nursing home outreach hygiene program. We have five dental chairs we provided free to five nursing homes in the area. We expect more of that to come out because we don't want to be just emergencies. And that's how we started, treat emergencies because they weren't being treated at the hospital. They were just pharmaceutical care. And these emergencies took care of our initial budget lickety split. It didn't take long. And so that was our mission, initial goal, take care of emergencies. But we got to have preventative care. So that's where we expanded the uh, nursing home outreach for the hygiene. We expanded into the uh, Head Start, which we have done before, but it took on more schools. We have uh, uh, outreach hygiene programs um, in uh, Pipestone. We also have outreach programs in Morris and uh, Browns Valley. I'm going to miss some. Ortonville, Glenwood, Starbuck. Um, Alec, of course, we do some outreach at the schools. Um, I'm missing a couple, I think. But uh, we've expanded greatly. And now the problem comes in, we're doing all this more hygiene, now we have more treatment. Now we can't handle all the treatment from all those communities because we're a long ways away. Well, this was a problem we had in the early days of the clinic. Uh, Mary Lou and, and stuff were doing a lot of hygiene. And uh, um, she didn't train me for hygiene, she trained me for everything else, but fortunately not hygiene. So we were getting further and further behind. At one point we had 150 to 175 people waiting for treatment dental problems. Um, that's too much. And so I came up with a plan one day in my little cubicle office that was shared as a closet and I had a coffee maker right here and a microwave and a kitchen sink behind my desk and in our original building it was pretty tight. So I thought, you know, these volunteer doctors we have have gaps at their office sometimes. Why can't they see my patients there? Well, they're not all Medicaid providers and they really don't want to be because of issues we can go into on the political side. And I promoted the More Smiles program. And I came up with that thought of why can't they see them there? I'll pay them what I get. And through the course of almost a year of jumping through hurdles at the Minnesota Department of Health, they threw me all kinds of if, ands, and buts, and I kept jumping the hurdles. And I think through the fact that they realized I wasn't going to give up, they said, yes, you can do the More Smiles program. Those doctors can be credentialed with your office. They can do the work in their office in a referral type situation. Um, I will pay them what I get. I do the billing, we do all that stuff. The patient remains ours of record, they don't have that responsibility. Uh, it was a good deal, we got it passed. Um, 
So then I hit him up for the critical access payment on that program because we're going to lose money on it severely because of the administrative costs of it. Uh, they said no because it's not being done at our facility, which was critical access. So the uh, program got going. We have, uh, at one point, we had 15 dentists, uh, you know, just an alec helping us out. We also uh, recruited Dennis and Morris. Uh, we now have them in Pipestone. Uh, we're talking tomorrow all the time about this program. And we were still losing money, though. And so we went forward, Dr. Moan and us and myself, went to the legislature over two sessions. And we argued, we need critical access payment for this program. It's critical. It's creating access. And we're going to areas where there is no care. Two sessions it took, and they went, yeah, you should have that. So we got it. About seven months, I believe it was, and the Department of Human Service took it away. Um, they uh, found some glitch in the system with the CMS and others that said we couldn't do that. Um, that was going to kill the program because now that program was large. We were, we were running a lot of money through one hand to the other, and in between we were losing. So we took the... Uh, Next route of going to our providers or our insurance companies and saying we can't do this anymore. Our main one again, Prime West, who does take good care of us, best they can, and they're local. And I went to their CEO, Jim Prisbilla, and I said, Jim, I'm sorry to tell you, but it won't be long down the road. We will not have the More Smiles program. We will have to discontinue it. We've lost the critical access. It's gotten so large that I can't finance it anymore. Through donations, it would take huge grants. He wasn't too happy because uh, he cares about his patients, of course. And about a week later, he called me and he says, we are going to pay you an administrative fee to keep our Prime West patients covered through More Smiles. So that's what we are doing. We are seeing those patients now through the More Smiles program. Um, and we see the others from the other um, billing entities. We lose money on those. And also our dentists are reluctant to take some of the other billing entities because of the disparity in the reimbursement. Now, that disparity has always been there. Uh, it's uh, not gotten smaller, and it's been a thing I've addressed for almost the 10 years I've been there with the uh, legislature. Why is one paying us 70 cents on the dollar and one's giving us 42, and it used to actually be 60 cents down to 29, so we've seen these increases, but the disparity is always following. To me, if I give each one of you a dollar and you go do what I tell you to do, you should all bring back the same change, and we're not seeing that, and I don't know why we can't get that fixed. If everybody paid 70 cents on the dollar like we get with Prime West, um, I could probably go fishing because that's like a PPO and uh, we would see the care. So that's a big area that we are going to continue to address to uh, fix that disparity and make the system work better for the patient. Um, I've worked with a lot of dentists over the years. Uh, the number one reason not being a Medicaid provider is reimbursement. Um, there's lots of things we can talk about creating access, but it, it is, is reimbursement is number one. The number two thing they come up with is, is patient responsibility. Um, we're very fortunate, from what I understand in the industry, we run about 11% fail rate. I've talked to dentists that had 30, 35, 40, 50% fail rates. Uh, I believe the University of Minnesota runs 30 or 35%. Um, those empty chair times are impossible to recoup the loss of. So we have a program, we spend a lot of time managing the patient, and we require them to confirm appointments. We require them to help us help them. And we've whittled ours down to 11%. If we ever hit about 20 or 22%, um, we would probably close. So there's, the patient responsibility issue is another big one. Um, the other thing we need to do is, is education, and we do promote oral health education uh, free. We always have. Uh, Mary Lou used to go and do uh, talks at all the area schools. Uh, it just got to be too much because there's a lot of schools. And, and the schools don't have time for it as much anymore. Uh, we still offer free oral health presentations at the schools in our area and further. Um, few accept it anymore because it's not mandatory and their academic time is limited, uh, they say, because of the education policies in place. Excuse me. <coughs> so. We also offer a program at schools called Open Wide. The Open Wide program, we have an assistant or a hygienist go there. They'll quite often give the presentation, the oral health presentation. Then they will 
as the kids leave, they take a quick look and see with a mirror of any major problems. They give them that disposable mirror, their bag of toothbrush, toothpaste, floss, and send them on their way. We catch major problems then. If that major problem is on a child that has a uh, private insurance, we refer them to a private office because uh, we don't compete with those folks. Um, the ones that have medical assistance or Minnesota care uh, or uninsured, sliding fee scale, those situations, we refer them to our office or one of our Morris Smiles doctors' offices. And so it works very well, but it's hard to get into the schools. So I think having some mandatory, I hate the word mandatory, but having some mandatory requirements in the schools to bring in the oral health education again like it used to. You have hearing, you have eye test, you have all that stuff. We have to get that, that oral health in there too. And uh, we have uh, two schools in the area that do allow us to do that. We come at the end of the table. Here's hearing, here's eyes, here's us. And yes, we have caught some kids with some major problems. Um, and we've also found a dental home for a lot of them because then the parents find out from the business card, oh, you do take medical assistance. Yes, we do. Because even though they're given that information when they sign up, it tends to get lost. And then we also have the problem with some of the parents in the education factor of educating the parents. And I know there's some of it done from the, the zero to five, we, I think we, we beat on pretty well. But after that, we tend to not as much. And a lot of times we don't see the teenagers at all. And we don't see them again until they're in their 20s with tooth problems. And so I think we need to continue that education through age 18. And we need funding to do that, of course, to get them into the schools and continue that education at the schools where they're corralled. So we can eliminate the transportation costs, the time from work, and that's the perfect setup for helping these kids with oral health education. And we need to do a generation. Can't go zero to five, stop, go back to zero to five, stop, go back to zero to five, stop. We need a generation because then when they become adults, their children should know and because they know. And I think that's what we, we, we need to see some follow through for that generation of, of children. Um, I'm not gonna get into political stuff, I promise them, uh, because there, there are a lot more issues I find that um, you know, could help the providers and also mainly help the patients. We uh, visit the capital as much as possible. Um, we're small, so we're not looked at much. Uh, we've sat on the Dental Service Advisory Committee for a while. Um, didn't pan out for us, but uh, there is avenues that I think people have to look at rather than just the normal. When we built our clinic, we looked out of the box. Um, the biggest thing we didn't want to do is compete with the private offices. We need volunteers. They're not going to come to me if I compete with them. Could I have made more money taking private insurance? You bet. Retail cash? You bet. But can't get volunteers. The volunteers generated the money we needed to make the business plan work because the money, the work they did, we got the money, we paid the rent, and then we put the rest in our kitty. We need that kitty to get large enough so we could get a new clinic, okay? Because if we're not financially healthy, as Mary Lou said, people aren't gonna give us money. Because now when we're going for large grants, they wanna make sure you are gonna be there tomorrow. And we will be. We'll be there for many years, forever, I hope. Um, not with me there, but. Um, somebody else, but uh, we've grown now and we look at this new expansion coming just because of demand and uh, yeah, um, those volunteers that were there the first years made this happen as much as anybody because of the dollars we were able to get through that. The grants and donations we received it amounts to about $672,000 since 2006, nice chunk of change, most of that in the last years of the growth um, the last project we did was uh, about a $400,000 project into what we're at now, and we had already gotten a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment and all that prior to that. Now the next expansion is a $550,000 expansion. Knock on wood, the money comes through for that. We're hoping within the next year we'd have that up and running. That'll allow us to hire another dentist, a couple more hygienists, and then expand our outreach program more and then also bring in some dental specialists, which we've been talking to. There's very limited coverage through the Minnesota healthcare programs for these specialists, but we have some we've talked to that feel they should help us, and so we wanna utilize that, that factor. And again, 
um, when they look at us, look at us, we're not in competition. We're, we're here to help you help the patient. So hopefully we can help with that. Uh, we're talking to some orthodontists, um, hopefully to come in and visit with us and help us out some. And so there's a, a whole community again coming into this um, rather odd clinic that uh, is staying alive uh, by not making money. And uh, so that challenge is working. Uh, we got a good board of directors. Um, amazingly, they give me thumbs up quite often. <laughs> I think they're again, they just kind of give up. But uh, they question my, my theory sometimes. But uh, again, the theories come from business where we, we have to keep the door open. Um, I'm probably missing some things I initially wanted to talk about because I didn't read my notes. But um, I think we still have to base the access issue as one issue but we need the education issue to help the access. The education of the families, the education of the parents, the schools, and that factor will help the access. Add that to the reimbursement issue. In my simple mind, you got things pretty well fixed. If you can get that education and the reimbursements, I, uh, I have private offices that'll take people. And uh, they are now, because they're going through me, because we handle the hurdles. That's why they like the More Smiles program. If there's a payment problem, that's my problem, not theirs. If there's a pre-authorization issue, that's my problem, not theirs. If there's a paperwork snafu, yeah, we take care of it. You know, I got a fantastic staff that we do take care of well, which we have to, but the staff, they, get, they got good hearts too. I mean, we sometimes have tough days. And uh, we uh, have to have people with good hearts to continue uh, having them work, and we've had them there now for some years, since 2012, July 2012 was our first full-time staff. And uh, it's amazing that uh, we've been fortunate enough to find a staff, because uh, when you go out and hire people, you don't know about the heart. You know about the resume, and you can meet them, but you don't know about the heart. But we've been fortunate to find all those uh, people that have a good heart, enjoy what we do. Again, we take care of them, because you gotta. And uh, that's a hurdle in itself, uh, because our reimbursements cover our wages and our rent. That's about it. Some of the supplies. The rest of it is donations. So that's how short we get. Again, if we got 70% of all of our reimbursement, I wouldn't have to have a whole lot more donations. Still have some for the major equipment, but uh, it would take the edge off. So those are the things that we see. So that's the future for us, the future for the, for the programs, all I hope for is, again, that education and reimbursement issue to come together to do it. Uh, we have too many young moms that still say they're just baby teeth. They're going to fall out anyway. Uh, we still send some two-year-olds to, to sedation dentistry for work. It's horrible. Uh, we shouldn't see that. Um, that's part of the education thing, again. Not an access. It's an education. And uh, I know we, we work on them. Uh, there's lots of groups in the area of Alexandria and Fergus Falls that, that do key on those young families, young mothers and all that, but we're not getting to them. We're not getting, getting them all and getting it done. And so that's what we hope to continue doing. So that's about all I got. Are there any questions? Rich wants to add something. Question? That's correct, and, and yep, that is a fine line. And we have talked to our doctors that are involved um, through the More Smiles and the board, of course. And what we do for non-covered services, and we have a, an area of non-covered services, um, that could be the patient needs scale and rip planing. Uh, what we've done with that in the past, and I want to continue in the future now that we have a new facility, because it was hard to do in our previous one, is I invite dental hygiene students in. And they can do those services free in our space. Well, before in our oldest place, we had no space. So when they came in, I had two hygienists standing around because I had to close the rooms to the students. Now with our new facility with eight additional rooms, those rooms can be used for that uh, dental hygiene students to come in and perform those scale and rip planes. If the patient wants to uh, pay us for it and they're a qualified, we only see MA, MinCare, mm -hmm. and they are an MA, MA patient, yeah, we offer it to them at the Prime West rate. 
and so they get a discount, just like the veterans we see. Uh, that veteran can take that $1,000 annual award to any office okay. and get retail work done. He can bring that $1,000 award to our office, you'll get prime west rate, so you get more done for the dollar. The doctors in our town know I do that. I've asked them, you got a problem with that? Nope, not at all. They're happy to do it. So we, wherever we go with more smiles, wherever we do in our clinic, we communicate completely and totally honest with all of our doctors. When we go to Pipestone the first time, we got to hold every doctor in Pipestone. We're coming, here's what we do. Pretty soon we signed up two doctors down there to join us because they found out we don't compete. Those doctors see my patient, they send me the bill, we submit it, we get the money, I write them a check. That's, they go, ah, that's clean, that's easy. And again, there's problems. I had a couple bills last week that uh, gentleman down in Pipestone was uh, the new code we got just a few sessions ago, the 9410 for the nursing home visit. That was a big one. That made us lose less money on our nursing home program because we lose money on that. And uh, I don't know if we ever will not, but it's such a valuable program, we have to keep it going. And he made a new denture for this elderly lady in the nursing home. Too hard to transport. So he went there several times for the fitting, you know, for everything. He billed us, and uh, Prime West Health even went, wait a minute, we got seven nursing home visit with no other code like limited exam or uh, filling? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, here's why. And Prime West Health called me back and they said, yeah, we're gonna pay those. Because number one, they know the transportation costs. Number two, the stress of that nursing home resident getting ready, leaving their atmosphere, they come to our place, they can be ornery. We see them there, not so ornery, okay? I mean, it's, it's, just, it's like the Head Start kids. You know, we have had moms over the years telling me and Mary Lou, that child's not gonna sit for you. They're fine, they're at Head Start, they're in their atmosphere. We're in their world now. And uh, so it's a totally different thing. So we do offer those non-covered services. A uh, patient comes in, for example, and says, I broke my partial. I don't have a reasonable excuse, therefore the state won't give me a new one for many years. What can I do? I will sell you one at the Prime West rate as long as you still are on MA MinCare. We have patients, or non-patients come in off the street and go, oh, I heard you do cheap uh, partials. Yeah, you on MA? No, no, bye. Okay. Yep, just cut and dried. 